Right, so my name is Matthias Tescher, and I'm going to present uh, some results of our work here at Leipzig University. First of all, I would like to thank my uh, group members, which all contributed to uh, this work and which are all part of this uh, MOPGA um, group that I have in Leipzig now. Let's start uh, with the content of the presentation. I will begin with a motivation in the background to tell you something about clouds, how they form and glaciate, and how they contribute to uh, the Earth's radiative budget. Then I will talk about aerosol cloud interactions, how they are generally inferred from spaceborne observations, and how we are going to do it at Leipzig University, or at least our vision for doing it. So right now, we are at the stage where we have developed all the tools, and we got some uh, pretty fresh results that I'm going to show today. And then I will uh, wrap up with a summary. So let's start with this uh, beautiful picture of, of clouds at visible wavelengths. And here we can see that the Earth would look very differently if there was no clouds. So these clouds generally cover about two thirds of the globe, and they are responsible for reflecting about half of the incoming solar radiation back to space. And that's why any change into their properties, particularly into their uh, reflective properties, are crucial for the Earth's radiative budget and also for um, um, global warming. So if we have, for instance, brighter clouds, then this would counteract the warming due to the increase in CO2 concentrations. And this is basically what is meant with aerosol cloud interactions, but we'll get to that in just a bit. A different view to look at this is in an actual measurement of uh, top of the atmosphere reflected shortwave radiation, where we can also see wherever we have clouds, we have these bright blobs, which refer to a large number of energy that is, that is reflected back to space before it could even enter the Earth um, atmosphere to um, be stored there and lead to a, to a warming of the atmosphere. So clouds are quite important and let's quickly look at how they are acting. Here we can see this uh, yellow arrow which shows the energy coming in from the sun. And then this energy can interact with high clouds which are mostly transparent and uh, leave the energy to uh, go to the Earth's surface where it is reflected, but mostly it warms the Earth's surface and then the Earth um, emits long wave radiation, which can then be trapped by these high clouds. If we have low level clouds, then they act very differently because they, as I mentioned, reflect all the incoming solar radiation right away back to space before it could even enter the system and go to the Earth's surface where it could lead to warming. On the other hand, those low level clouds also emit a lot of the emitted thermal uh, radiation right back to the surface, but that's a problem mostly in the Arctic. So we can see that different types of clouds act very differently. And if we would want to have less incoming solar radiation making it down to the surface, then we need to look at those clouds and maybe increase the fraction of those clouds or make those clouds brighter. So that's what's usually referred to when people talk about um, solar radiation management with low level clouds. Okay, so to get clouds, we need to have aerosol particles. And I would like to show this video rather than just talking about about how, aeros uh, how clouds are formed. What you can see here is a video taken uh, through a research cruise in the Arctic. And here we have a piping hot cup of tea. And you can see that you don't see what you usually see, which would be steam coming off the cup. So there's the tea back in and now it's soaking. And in just a bit, the person who is now uh, preparing the tea will turn around and get to a source of aerosols. And as soon as those aerosols are available, clouds form. That means if we are in a very clean environment, clouds cannot form. And the other way around, it means if, if we want clouds to form, we need particles. You can see this in just a bit. Here you can now see the steam, the steam which you couldn't see before. So that's basically the particles we have available in the atmosphere are quite important or determine which clouds are formed and also uh, if they cloud if they are forming 
also, if we increase the number of particles in the atmosphere, so in that case of the video, you could see an increase from zero to something. If we increase the number of particles, we get a change of the cloud properties. So in that case, it was from zero cloud to some cloud. These aerosol particles, they're also responsible for cloud glaciation. That means for ice formation. So if we are in the regular atmosphere, we would only find a uh, cloud ice form at temperatures lower than minus 38 degrees Celsius if there was no particles available. So the particles we need now are called ice nucleating particles. So the ones we need to form cloud droplets are called cloud condensation nuclei or CCN. That's something I will refer to later. And the ones we need to form cloud ice are called ice nucleating particles. What we can see here that in the real atmosphere, observations show us that we observe cloud ice almost down to temperatures of zero degree, temp uh, zero degree Celsius rather than those minus 38 degrees. That means there's not only homogeneous freezing acting, so there's not uh, water that turns to ice without anything uh, coming to its aid. Usually there's an aerosol particle involved and that's those INPs. So it could be immersion freezing where an aerosol particle is in the water droplet uh, leading it to freeze. It could be contact freezing where a super cool droplet gets in contact with this aerosol particle and freezes. Could be deposition freezing, which means that water vapor freezes onto the particle and it grows to a crystal. Or we have condensation freezing where water first condenses and then forms the ice crystal. So there's different mechanisms that are proposed and they are all acting in the atmosphere to some degree. But the bottom line here is if we want to form ice in the atmosphere at warmer temperatures, and what we mean here is temperatures warmer than minus 38 degrees, we need these INPs. Okay, that's the background on the uh, need for aerosol particles and forming clouds and glaciating clouds. Now let's switch gear and move to climate change and the effect of aerosols on what's happening. Here we can see the temporal evolution of a global surface temperature. And uh, this is from a website called globalwarmingindex.org where you can basically get this um, updated for the current month. So this is from December, 2020. Maybe they are not updating it so often these days, but it's, uh, very recent, usually the update. What we can see here is the observations, which are the black lines. And we can see the um, natural warming and cooling, which is the uh, blue line. And basically all the natural effects do not lead to this warming. Instead, the uh, human induced warming, which is the uh, orange line pretty much resembles what we can observe in the in the observations. So we know that there is this warming and we know that it's man-made, but we don't know all the components of how the Earth's radiative budget is influenced. So here we have the different effective radiative, radiative forcings um, for different uh, forces. So there's the gases, there's uh, aerosols, and there's, uh, for instance, contrails and aviation introduced cirrus. What I'm going to talk about is this effect, the aerosol uh, cloud effect and the aerosol radiation in effect. Aerosol radiation means that the radiation coming from uh, the Earth surface or coming from um, the top of the atmosphere is interacting directly with the aerosols. Aerosol cloud interactions means that the aerosols affect the clouds and then those clouds interact with the radiation. And I'm going to talk about this on the next slides. So we are interested in this part. And the interesting thing about this aerosols part is that it hasn't really changed a lot over the years. So AR6 is the current assessment report of the IC uh, oh, IPCC. I'm sorry, there's a typo here. It's the um, current uh, assessment report, AR5 is the one prior to it. And we can see that the range of values hasn't really changed a lot. It's been narrowed a bit, but there's still lots of uncertainty, mostly in the aerosol cloud interactions. And if you go back to even earlier assessment reports, then you will find the same result. 
we can also see that uh, there's a lot of model evidence and there's some observational evidence with the observations tending towards uh, larger values and the models tending towards smaller values, but both have their uh, pros and cons. So we are interested in this bit. And uh, now I would like to show what those aerosol cloud interactions actually mean. So here we have the sun, here we have the atmosphere with aerosols and clouds in it. And then we have an unperturbed cloud where we have a certain number of cloud droplets of a certain size. So these are the aerosol radiation interactions where the radiation is interacting with the, with the aerosols directly. That's the, um, this dark blue part here. And then we have the aerosol cloud interactions, which now happen when we have an aerosol perturbation. So the idea is here that if we have the same amount of liquid water, then more aerosol particles lead to smaller cloud droplets compared to this unperturbed cloud. And these smaller cloud droplets increase the brightness of the cloud and the clouds appear, well, brighter and can reflect more solar radiation. You can see this here in this example of glass beads where we have large glass beads corresponding to this unperturbed clouds and then these uh, small glass beads which correspond to this perturbed cloud where the aerosol particles um, le led to these smaller cloud droplets. And we can see just from this uh, simple experiment that those clouds are much brighter. Well, if this were the cloud analogs, we can see this in nature as well. And the best example samples are so-called chip tracks where we can see that chips that um, move under a stratocumulus cloud cover lead to these to these tracks, which are related to the ship exhausts being mixed into the cloud and increasing the cloud droplet number concentration in there, leading to those smaller droplets, which make the cloud uh, brighter. There's a couple of other effects that have been proposed. For instance, those smaller droplets suppress the formation of uh, precipitation, which would increase liquid water content. So that more water in the cloud, they increase the height of the cloud, so the vertical extent, and they increase cloud lifetime just because they are not raining that much. There's also something that can be observed in those cloud tracks. So here we now have a cloud track and the yellow line is the overpath of a spaceborne LIDAR instrument, which can perform height resolved uh, measurements of aerosol particles and uh, of clouds, and which is also one of the instruments that we are using at Leipzig. You can see here that, so this blue part corresponds to this one, the red one to this one, the red one basically meaning the ship track, and the green one part is this one. We can see that from the reflectance point of view, the red part is brighter. That's what we see by eye. But if we look at the cloud droplet effective radius, we can see that those droplets are indeed smaller. And on top of that, we can also see that the cloud top for this red part, so for the ship track, is indeed elevated, just as proposed on the previous slide in one of those uh, aerosol cloud interaction effects. Now, since um, the fifth assessment report of the IPCC, there has been a change in terminology. So this is what we call aerosol radiation interactions, as I mentioned before, and this semi-direct effect as well. And the aerosol cloud interactions are now split into this uh, radiative forcing, which is this effect, also called the Toomey effect. And so that's the effect of clouds being brighter if there's more aerosols available under the assumption that the liquid water content or liquid water path doesn't change. However, there's also what we call adjustments. So all these effects that follow, like the change in liquid water content, the change in cloud lifetime, these are now called adjustments. And together they form what's called effective radiative forcing due to aerosol cloud interactions. So that's important for uh, understanding the following slides. And so that's the terminology since AR5 and it's also used in AR6.
Okay, but now let's take a look at what those aerosol cloud interactions mean from a mathematical point of view. It means that we have a forcing, which is related to a change in the concentration of uh, aerosol particles that are emitted uh, by human activities. So it's an anthropogenic chain and anthropogenically induced change of aerosol concentration. This change in aerosol concentration changes the droplet number concentration. And this change in droplet number concentration in the end changes the uh, radiation that is reflected back to space. So these are the perturbances that are included in actions. And now the this effect of the cloud droplet number concentration on the radiation can now be uh, split up into the radiative forcing due to aerosol cloud interactions, which is this first effect or Tumi effect, and all those adjustments that I mentioned before. So we have an adjustment that is related to the change of cloud fraction. So that is uh, basically the amount of cloud that is uh, present due to the change in cloud droplet number concentration, the amount of cloud liquid water path, that is the amount of liquid water in the cloud, and the change related to the cloud top temperature, which is equivalent to the cloud top height. And this change is always induced from, uh, by the change in cloud droplet number concentration. So now what we need to quantify, particularly for um, quantifying the effect of uh, anthropogenic activities on uh, climate change is this perturbation of the cloud droplets related to a change in aerosol concentration. How is that done with satellite observations? Well, usually you take uh, passive sensors, that is sensors that provide you with an aerial picture, for instance, and then in that picture, you could have pixels where you have a cloud and you get cloud, cloud properties retrieved. You have um, pixels where you have aerosols and you have pixels where there's no results. So either the signal isn't strong enough from the aerosol side, or well, actually it is strong. There's not strong enough from the aerosol side or at least cannot resolve the aerosol signatures and there's no clouds. So these are no retrievals. And it's typically on uh, the scale of one degree. And usually to get this, you need to combine observations from different sensors. They are on a coarse grid already. You often take daily values also from a temporal point of view. This is, is very coarse. And then you get a connection between the aerosol concentration and the cloud droplet number concentration. And that can look, for instance, like this. So now AOD is aerosol optical thickness or aerosol optical depths. It's a column. Um, it's the column aerosol concentration. So that has uh, several caveats. First of all, while it's a column value, you don't really know if those aerosols are actually interacting with the clouds. And you also don't really know what those aerosols are if they are efficient. CCN, well, that's what we get from the uh, aerosol index that's that is correlated with cloud droplet number concentration. And in that particular example from uh, the studies by Grisbert et al, where they compile these 2D histograms, we see that if the aerosol concentration increases, and uh, uh, be advised that this is the column concentration, then the cloud droplet number concentration increases as well, which is, um, or which would follow the idea of the Tumi effect. Then regarding the adjustments, we can look, for instance, at the cloud liquid water path and see how this changes with a change in cloud droplet number concentration. For something like this, um, people would look at what's called a natural laboratory or natural experiments. And for instance, volcanic eruptions provide uh, such a situation where you have an aerosol perturbance, which is large scale and relatively controlled. So there's a volcanic eruption of a, a certain time period. And you know what the situation was like before that eruption. And you can compare this to what happens during the eruption. And that has been done in this study, for instance, where you can see that there has uh, 
that there has been a um, regional decrease in cloud droplet effective radius. We can also see this in the histogram for during the volcanic eruption, and that's from the Ahuluan eruption on Iceland in 2014. And this is compared to the long-term observations. So that's uh, more than 10 years before the eruption where cloud droplet effective radius was, or the entire PF was moved or is shifted to larger values. And this can also be done for liquid water paths. And in this particular study, it has found that this uh, liquid water path adjustment really is neglect neglectable. You can see that both PDFs are almost identical. Other studies have used different uh, natural laboratories, for instance, blooms from fires or from cities. So this would be from individual fires. These cities here, this is St. Petersburg. This is uh, Moscow. And those are these Russian fires that uh, occur for a couple of years now. This is uh, fires in, in Canada, I think, if I remember correctly. And this is from, um, from large industry. And you can see those um, plumes, which are very similar to the ship tracks, only that they have a fixed source. And this is used as well to investigate a change of liquid water path with a change in cloud droplet number concentration. And in this study, they find by normalizing the change in liquid water path also to the change in uh, cloud droplet number concentration, that the liquid water path adjustment compensates about 23% of the radiative forcing due to aerosol cloud interaction. So that's due to the Tumi effect or this increase of cloud albedo due to the decrease in the cloud droplet size and increase in cloud droplet number condensation. In general, excuse me, models were found to underestimate the compensation of those different effects. So this was all for warm clouds, that is clouds without cloud ice. If we now go to ice containing clouds, things get much more complicated. Particularly now we have the CCN acting, so the particles that affect um, water clouds, but also those INPs that I mentioned before. So those particles that might lead uh, a super cooled cloud droplet to freeze a temperature much warmer than minus 38 degrees. And there's this nice diagram here by Rosenfeld et al, where they basically show what happens if we have an unperturbed atmosphere where we have the cloud uh, droplets, they grow. So cloud droplet effective radius increases. Eventually they form warm rain. So that's rain without the ice phase. Then ice starts to form. We have a mixed phase cloud and then eventually the cloud is fully glaciated. If we now increase the aerosol concentration, so we move to this upper uh, left edge, uh, side of the plot, we have more aerosols, we have a longer time where clouds could just uh, diffuse, or so they, they disappear without anything happening, or without cloud droplets growing. Then we have this uh, coalescence uh, range where they, uh, where the cloud droplets grow in size, and eventually they, well, they don't really form this warm rain any longer, but turn to become mixed phase clouds. And you can see here already that there is a delay in droplet freezing and the temperature when um, cloud glaciation starts is decreased. So clouds need to get colder and colder. And there's a couple of effects that have been proposed, which are the effect that the smaller droplets delay glaciation, which is what you can see here. It takes longer for droplets to, to grow and they are glaciating later. If we have now more of those INPs, of those particles that support glaciation, then it might happen that clouds just glaciate right away and start raining, which would decrease cloud lifetime. So these are already two counteracting effects. And then we have this concept of convective invigoration where um, the clouds, uh, cloud droplets cannot precipitate as they did here, but rather reach a level where they can freeze. And they fall down, melt again, and so they uh, lead to a larger transport of energy on an end heat upwards, particularly by um, releasing latent heat when they are um, when they are moving through the cloud. So it's all much more complicated, and that leads me to this um, mid presentation summary, where I basically want to. Um, 
um, shortly summarize what I've just said. So there's many uh, processes that have been proposed, but few of them are fully understood so far. Then we have the uh, effect of the aerosols that um, has to rival the effect of the atmosphere. So it's very crucial to account for the effect of meteorological parameters, because whatever we might identify as an aerosol effect could also just be related to meteorological parameters, just uh, such as uh, updraft velocity or relative humidity. Then it's particularly hard to quantify what the unperturbed background looked like. So what did the clouds look like before there was human activity? We basically don't have a baseline for uh, what to compare our results to, because there's no observations of really unperturbed clouds. Then, as I mentioned, there's the cloud effect, uh, aerosol cloud interaction effects and those rapid adjustments. And those are nonlinear processes that complicate the studies. A huge problem is that um, the parameter that is used to quantify the aerosol contribution in most spaceborne studies are not really uh, uh, need a, they are not really containing the information we need to uh, get information on those aerosols that actually affect the clouds. So if we have a column integrated parameter that we don't cannot even really place at cloud level, while we actually need information on those CCN and INP, then we are not using the right parameters. And also most of these um, aerosol cloud interaction studies, they are using sensors that cannot really um, observe a cloud throughout its lifetime, but that's something that we will get to in the second half of the talk. So most studies are also for warm clouds. As I mentioned, there's the Tumi effect that dominates, which is the cloud brightening effect. There's minor contributions of the adjustments, as far as we know, and uh, systematic studies of uh, aerosol cloud interactions in cold clouds are really scarce, simply because there's currently no parameter that we could use to quantify the concentration of those ice nucleating particles in the atmosphere. So all we know is basically for warm clouds. That leaves me, or that uh, leads me to what we are doing in my group at Leipzig University. As I mentioned, the um, um, most of the studies from spaceborne observations, they employ sensors that cannot really follow a cloud throughout its lifetime. This is what this uh, red and um, blue line that you can see on this plot represents. It's a so-called polar orbiting sensor. They are circulating the globe and they are always moving to another position. So they always, or they can only provide snapshots of um, a cloud field and they are just incapable of observing the same cloud twice. If you look at the background image, on the other hand, this is provided by a geostationary sensor. And this is this sensor is capable of following a cloud throughout its lifetime, like this deep convection here at the equator, and uh, also provide a view of the full Earth disk. That's what this is. This is in information retrieved with those geostationary sensors with the much more detailed information from the polar orbiting sensors. So the idea here is to put the polar orbiting observations into the context of the life cycle of the cloud as we observe it from the geostationary observations. So our approach basically follows this methodology. We take those geostationary in those observations. And in the end, we get information on the position, the size, the temporal development of mean cloud properties, and all of this for individual clouds. So rather than using these highly averaged um, aerosol and cloud fields, as I showed earlier, we are going down to the level of individual clouds. Then we developed a methodology where we can find the intercepts between those cloud trajectories we retrieved in step one with the uh, tracks of those polar orbiting satellites, which have all those uh, science grade sensors on board and provide the most detailed observations that we can get so far. And then once we have combined or we have 
the location where to combine the observations, we want to infer the CCN and uh, hopefully soon as well the INP concentrations at those intercepts. And we just had a paper published um, in January where we describe the methodology. And this uh, third step gives us uh, CCN and INP concentrations at cloud base and top respectively. So if we want to form clouds, we need to know the aerosol concentration at cloud base because this is where the clouds form, the warm clouds. And if we want to know Uh, at which, or if we want to investigate how clouds glaciate, we need to know the aerosol concentration at cloud top because that's where the clouds are coldest. And if we have combined all this information, we get this uh, bottom up data set of individual clouds and their surrounding uh, aerosol fields that we then want to use for studying aerosol cloud interactions. So, right now, we have developed everything on the left side of this slide and hopefully during the last year of our MOPCA project, we will dive a bit deeper into this uh, fourth uh, step. But let me uh, show you what we have developed. So this is how uh, clouds in a geostationary satellite observation can be tracked. This is just for an individual cloud so that it wouldn't be too messy. We will see more uh, tracks on the next slide. So we can basically pick a cloud, follow it throughout its lifetime. So here it forms and at the end of this track, it uh, dissolves. And then we can do this for all the clouds in an area that we select. And we can basically infer information on the cloud lifetime. And we can see how this uh, cloud lifetime behaves for such a large number of trajectories. So in the end, we had a quarter of a million trajectories looking at the region around the Canary Islands doing just uh, using to do this actually extends over much more than 10 years, 15 years. That's a huge amount of data. We can see that um, there's this um, uh, frequent, this, um, this power spectrum in cloud lifetime, and there's also one in cloud extent. So we can see that the smallest clouds are most abundant, and also short-lived clouds are most abundant, and only few of those clouds really live for a very long um, time. That's what we can extract. And uh, we can also see that if we now separate between the short-lived clouds, so that's clouds that exist for less than one hour time, and long-lived clouds, which exist for longer than one hour, they show different properties. So this would be the maximum of the cloud optical thickness, which relates to uh, also to the brightness of the clouds. And we can see that those long-lived clouds have a much uh, larger maximum cloud optical thickness. They also have a larger cloud droplet number concentration almost twice as much as those short-lived clouds. And here this is um, on a relative time scale that extends from cloud formation to cloud dissolution. So that, that way we can cover the clouds or the different clouds in this um, cloud lifetime spectrum on the previous slide. Now, what we can also do is we can go to a different area and a different sensor. And this is very preliminary data where we uh, track, let me run the movie because it takes a while. Um, where we track clouds in a um, observations of a sensor that is looking at the Americas. And this is for the, uh, for the Caribbean doing an experiment called Eureka, which is focused on uh, trade vent cumulus. And that's exactly what we can see here. So the sensor is called the Advanced Baseline Imager on the satellite called GOES-R. And this has a much higher temporal and spatial resolution compared to what we have used in uh, this uh, paper that we published last year. And here we can see that we can basically track all the clouds we can see in, the, uh, in this region where the observations are performed. In this movie, only those clouds that persist for longer than uh, four hours are shown. So also actually those smaller clouds 
nodes, they are tracked as well. The movie starts here and we can see a decrease in cloud fraction. So cloud cover is reduced and then more clouds form. In the um, gray shading here, we can also see the um, number of clouds. So the pink and uh, red lines refer to area, while the number of clouds here is in the range of, well, of course, one to about 25 per time step which is, as it's mentioned here, one minute. So that's something that we want to look at uh, in future because it gives us much uh, higher temporal and spatial resolution and hopefully more detailed results. Okay, so in the second step, I mentioned that we need to match those cloud trajectories that we saw on the previous two slides with the observation of those polar orbiting satellites. And that's exactly what you can see here for uh, a domain covering Central Europe and Northern Africa. So all these blue lines are a cloud trajectory and those uh, red spots are those intercepts for which we can get the aerosol information in the vicinity of the cloud so that we can actually study aerosol cloud interactions. But first we need to retrieve the CCN and INP concentrations. So our inspiration is from this paper by Mamouri and Ansman, where they developed a methodology for ground-based depolarization LIDAR measurements and um, combined with sun photometer observations. So these are all optical instruments standing at ground and they observe the atmosphere. And what you get is in the end, um, a backscatter coefficient related to different aerosol types that is converted into an extinction coefficient. That's still what's measured. And the crucial part is this extinction to number concentration conversion. So in this study, they were used this uh, additional information of sun photometer measurements. They infer the number concentration of those particles that are likely to act as uh, CCN and INP. And then they use um, published parameterizations to infer the actual CCN and INP number concentration. If we want to do this from space with Calypso observations, we need to change something here because we don't really have this aeronet information or the sun photometer information. And uh, my student, Gotama Shaturi, has developed this methodology where the normalized size distributions in this Calypso aerosol model are basically scaled in a way that they can be used to reproduce the measured extinction coefficient using this uh, MOPSMAP scattering model. But uh, what it means in the end is that we have a consistent methodology using the spaceborne LIDAR observations and the related aerosol model to now retrieve these CCN concentrations. And we can compare this to uh, airborne in situ measurements that we can see here. This is for an aircraft campaign, campaign called ATOM. And uh, we can see that the number of the particles that are likely to act as CCN between what we retrieve from Calypso observations and what is retrieved in these airborne measurements is actually quite good. And um, we can also you not know, disentangle this for different aerosol types that are resolved in the aerosol model of the spaceborne LIDAR instrument. And we can see that even for the different aerosol types, this works quite well. We can do this for the CCN concentrations as well. This is a preliminary data. So the uh, picture quality is not that good. Um, but we can see that if we compare CCN concentrations using Calypso observations to in situ measurements, then also we get an agreement which is acceptable given the uh, uh, nature of this pattern. So now that we have confirmed that our Calypso CCN retrieval is a, a useful tool. We can use it to infer annual CCN concentration maps. This would be during the day areas. And we can see where CCN particles are most abundant. And we can also now, of course, split this for the different aerosol types. And we can see where uh, mineral dust contributes most to CCNs and where elevated smoke contributes most. So this is information that previously was not available. So to now wrap up the presentation as I'm reaching the end, I would like to show some very recent results which I just received last Friday. And this is now uh, regarding the effect of 
ice nucleating particles on mid-level clouds. So what we see here is the observations from the geostationary satellite, all the different colors mark different time steps. And then we have this um, ground track of the polar orbiting spaceborne LIDAR. So at some point they intersect. We found the interception as just as before. And for this point here, we can now combine the information from the two sensors. So we have the Calypso observation. It shows us there's mineral dust at the side layer between four to six or seven kilometers height. And here in this gap, we have the cloud. That's actually the reason for the gap. And we have the cloudy pixels with this cloud top height. And we can now infer the, CC, uh, the INP concentration from um, the extinction coefficient we get from the Calypso LIDAR. And we can link this to the individual pixels we get from a geostationary satellite observation. And what we get in the end, if we take, for instance, the uh, cloud optical thickness from the geostationary satellite is a scatter plot like this. So as I mentioned before, I just got this uh, last week and it's pretty fresh. But what we can see is that for different aerosol types, we, well, actually we have, first of all, lots of data. This is for an, an entire year, 2015, for this uh, European domain that we saw before. And we have uh, mineral dust, polluted dust, which is this brown and uh, elevated smoke. acting and we can see INPs or if we find increased number of INPs there's now two branches of cloud optical thickness there's this one where nothing really happens and then there's this one where an increase in INP concentration also leads to an increase in cloud optical thickness now this is for a time delay between the observations of one hour if we were to decrease this to half an hour the correlation would actually improve but as I said, this is um, just very recent results and we are hoping to continue along this line in the future. Also, this is uh, using the INP retrieval methodology uh, of uh, Mamouri and Ansman and not yet the one that we have developed. So we are still working on that one. So to summarize, we... We had developed a new approach to investigate of individual clouds that we track in geostationing aerosol field that we can extract from spaceborne light ups. Uh, get information at the height of. We can track those individual clouds and we can infer the proper. related to this cloud. We can retrieve CZN and INP concentration from a spaceborne ladder measurements and connect this to the clouds methodology that allows us to combine those two informations. So before we we'll spend the next year actually apply. Um, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your Uh, interest in what okay thanks a lot matthias uh, sometimes you were a little bit interrupted and especially now during your summary you were but i hope that everyone could uh, actually um, get what you were talking about so in, in uh, during your talk everything was fine so um Okay, excellent. I guess the summary is not so crucial because it's basically what's written on the screen. Yeah, okay, perfect. So um, as normal, we, we can have questions through the question answer tool, through the chat, and also by just raising your hands. Uh, so the first one is from Alain Leger, and it's actually related to one of your first slides uh, where you showed the uh, global warming trend, uh, but also how natural warming changed, and he's asking how natural warming is calculated. Uh, okay, yeah, there's this is about this global, warm, global warming index.org plot. There's actually um, a paper that describes the entire procedure they are uh, they have developed to um, 
get this global warming index. So it's all described there, but it's based on uh, global climate models. So in these global climate models, you can basically switch off the anthropogenic influence, and then you get what would happen if there was no human activity, basically. And that's that's the benchmark to compare to, to uh, infer what the human effect would be. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot. Uh, then we have a question by Manvendra Dubey. Can your analysis data address Cirrus Cloud changes feedbacks? Uh, okay. So over the last years, we've really focused on developing this methodology to to track the clouds and to concentrations. The next step now to is, as I mentioned, to actually apply this. And the one part of this application, well, actually the first part would be to identify which clouds we want to target and then find um, regions where we can do that. So as I have shown, we have, um, apart from looking at those um, clouds around the Canary Islands, which we used to develop the tracking methodology, we have looked at those trade vent cumulus clouds uh, in the Caribbean. And that would basically one target cloud, the straight wind cumulus. Cirrus clouds would also be a target cloud, of course, because they are, well, they are not so easy to uh, quantify in their radiative forcing. And they are important because they are trapping lots of outgoing long wave radiation, as I've showed on one of the first slides. But uh, we so far have not really tested a tracking methodology for cirrus clouds. So here we would uh, first need to uh, um, put in some brain work again before we can do that. So now we first want to do what we can do, which is those low level water clouds and mixed phase clouds. And mixed phase clouds is already something that has rarely been studied before. Thank you. Um, can, can you maybe explain a bit more where the problem is between uh, the two or uh, different um, the two different uh, satellite products. So the, I, I believe that the LIDAR is a laser which actually cannot measure when clouds are there or, or and the other one is just optical observations with a camera and you combine these or? That's right. So these, these passive observations, they are um, usually radiometers. So if, if they are operating at a visible wavelength, then they just turn into a camera and we can see the pictures, but they're actually radiometers which operate at selected wavelengths. And then you can extract information from these wavelengths. So they're not, they're not always operating in the visible, but also at infrared wavelengths. And they uh, basically take these pictures and they see the radiation reflected from the Earth's surface or from the clouds. From the, Well, they basically see what the Earth looks like at the top of the atmosphere. The, um, LIDAR does emit a laser pulse. And because this is a pulse, well, it has a beginning and, the, and an end. And when it is emitted, a clock is set and it is stopped when this pulse comes back and then the next one is emitted. And from that and the known speed of light, we can infer the distance from where a LIDAR signal is returned to the detector. And this is how you get a height resolved measurement. And if there's a cloud, then this LIDAR signal can be attenuated, particularly if it's a water cloud. But fortunately, if you look down from space, you first have to face those ice clouds and they are not as optically thick as water clouds. So if you are sitting at the ground, usually these water clouds, they um, disturb all your measurements and you can just switch off the instrument and go home because you cannot see anything. But from space, uh, you can see uh, lots of aerosols, even if there's these thin cirrus clouds. And you get the height resolved information. That's important. Great, thanks. Chien, uh, you raised your hand at some point, but you lowered it again. Uh, no, I'm still there. <laughs> ah, okay, sorry. Anyway, 
Yeah, yeah hey, uh, Matthias, you don't get to see me anyway, so my camera. Um, it's fascinating, actually. Um, there's a, you know, um, um, I had a two uh, question uh, wondering about the, uh, the nature here, uh, the study. It's, uh, you know, uh, I know so use uh, um, uh, Calypso um, as a, some sort of a combination or maybe validation or, or uh, collaboration tools. Um, I think you know better just uh, than I do. It's the, the sampling always being a problem of Eclipse. Um, the, um, we we don't um, we don't have uh, you know uh, many samples uh, on that. So when you um, when you do the uh, you know combine that with the geostation data, uh, did you um, uh, what did you do? You you sorry, I, I, sorry, I, I got kicked out of my uh, Wi-Fi. I just came back. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's sorry. a really nice sound. <laughs> All of a sudden, it disappeared for a while. Anyway, just say uh, just, uh, handling the limited uh, Eclipse uh, sample against a geostation. So did you have adopt any strategy statistically, like, for example, cloud origin or maybe zonal origin or something? Because, um, you know, uh, it tend to be probably Eclipse or focus on. Uh, ha ha having more um, sampling on one type of things or one area. So did you did you do anything about that? Um, the strategy. The, the question is if we hmm. if yeah, do the uh, and cloud regimes. Um, that's exactly what we want to do now in the last year of the mockup. Oh. project. So as I mentioned, we um, have just really finished developing the tools mm -hmm. and now the, the real work can start, so to say. Okay. Uh, so, okay. okay. So that's the one thing. Also, another thing is I, 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 pay, uh, I put my, um, my expectation on you, uh, maybe last year. So there's a, there's a, a lot of, uh, um, Opinion against uh, you know the the uh, the passive sensor based uh, you know polar orbital based uh, study for example mm -hmm. you know Danny Rosenfeld the long here uh, build up uh, like a um, you know particle vertical distribution along cloud so actually they were they were doing the top cloud top information based on the cloud top uh, distribution and build up uh, pretend to be within a single cloud and they have a uh, you know, vertical distribution. And, uh, you know, that has been uh, the only game in the town. So, but now you, uh, um, are you going to planning do at least uh, some sort of comparison to see at least uh, over, you know, analyzed region they have been published and to see if there is anything interesting. Mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. To uh, your your uh, suggestion is to go back to the literature, find or identify studies that have been, or regions that have been studied a lot, and then see yeah. how our methodology compares to what has been retrieved before. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's a good idea. That's definitely worth trying. But as I said, we are we are now. At this midpoint where we. Or doing what we want to do, and that's uh, that's a great suggestion. Thanks. Okay, we have uh, another question by Alain Leger. Um, can you already state the general tendency of different human products, like aerosols, uh, on climate change? Or different human produced aerosols. Sorry. Okay. Well. If you talk about human produced aerosols, then it's mostly black carbon. So combustion aerosols. And they are mostly cooling. So if you would just consider those uh, aerosol radiation interactions, well, in fact, all aerosols are cooling because they reflect solar radiation before it can uh, get to the Earth's surface. Um, this black carbon might absorb some radiation in the atmosphere where it is because it's highly absorbing. But that's 
what the, the primary aerosol that is considered when uh, looking at anthropogenic aerosols. If you go to the um, IPCC report, then they actually state that they did not consider uh, aerosol effects on ice clouds because black carbon was found to be a neglect neglectable INP. So it's not efficient INP, and so it doesn't need to be considered um, to identify a man-made effect. But what we are interested in is um, the, the general mechanism of how aerosol concentration affects cloud properties. So identifying what part of this change in aerosol concentration is anthropogenic, you could say is kind of secondary because first you need to see what the effect is. And from the end, an increase in wildfire activity could be man-made. So that's then a different more uh, emission of mineral dust. Aerosol, and those are very efficient. I still not that simple. And that's the, the entire problem with the aerosols and the aerosol cloud interactions. <laughs>